Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast where we spin the jams and spill the tea and this week we're coming at you with a brand new episode of the show where we're covering two brand new records. This week we are covering a new album by Every Time I Die, their new album Radical, as well as the new album from JPEG Mafia, LP! For the exclamation point so I, I, i'm looking forward to the follow-up killer mike i <laughs> we're also going to be covering some other albums in our peripheral content this is the final episode of the 1991 retrospective we're kicking it off with loveless this week so you're definitely going to want to tune into that and we are also doing a record club this week which is of course for skeleton tyler uh he picked uh, the album Emergency and I by the Dismemberment Plan. So, you know, that's a, that's a big one. Uh, this week on the channel, if you may have missed it, we did a 1991 retrospective episode for uh, Bandwagon-esque by Teenage Fan Club. Uh, so go check that out to prepare for the last episode if you haven't. And we also did the record club for fucking what an aviary. That's right. Julia Holter's progressive pop masterpiece. Go check that out. It's a good video. We talk about the good sound and music. Indeed. And of course, if you could not tell, this is our Halloween episode. And I, I am Phoebe Bridgers. Tyler is not present. Tyler has passed away. And now the ghost of the Chinese satellite lives on. And his I'm singing stead. at a funeral tomorrow. A- ab- absolutely. Your vocal range is incredible, Phoebe. Elliot Smith says hi. And so. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's dead. Baby, it's Without any further ado, let's get into, <laughs> as we always do, what we've been listening to over the past seven days. Jake, why don't you kick us off? What have you been listening to recently? To prepare for this week, I did a brief little dive into the works of JPEG Mafia because uh, I'm familiar with all of this stuff, but I just kind of, I, I never really like formally dived into him to prepare for an upcoming album release. It's always been like, oh, hey, he's got a new thing. I should listen to it. Then I usually do. Um, but I'll probably get into it a little bit more when we talk about it. But um, he's good. I quite like him. Uh, I'm not sure that there is a formal way to dive into someone. Well, uh, okay. But uh, Veteran, great, pretty, pretty great album. Uh, I don't really think I agree with the general consensus that that's his best. I like it a lot, but I'm kind of more skewed towards all my heroes or cornballs thus far. I think that's probably my favorite project of his. Um, I, I really do be liking when that man sings and just puts a disgusting amount of auto tune on his voice, man, like Peggy's like the fucking, he's like hyper pop death grips and it's somehow 70 times less annoying than that sounds. Um, I want to shout out just real quick while I'm here. I checked out as part of an ongoing project that I'm working on that will be revealed with time. I checked out his 2016 album, Black Ben Carson this week yeah. and was not expecting to enjoy that as much as I did. That's probably my yeah. favorite, my favorite Peggy project so far, actually. It's pretty good. I, I'm a, like, I kind of like it when he goes more for the like really heavily atmospheric beats. I, I, I don't know how to describe his production other than it, it, it sounds wet. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it it sounds, yeah. <laughs> wet is maybe a more visceral word than something like textural, which is probably something I'll use a lot it's, when we review no, it. No, that's true. But, um, but yeah, I, I spent a lot of time this week, or a decent amount of time this week, trying to think about how to describe the way that JPEG Mafia makes a beat. Because there's very kind of consistent uh, style that he has that you see you know, across tracks on LP. And it's so like, it's so hard to like explain, but we'll do our best. 
yeah i i just he's one of my favorite per, like current working like beat smiths uh just i just fucking love his production and that's not to like say anything again like i think he's a terrific mc he's a really good lyricist and i think the best thing about him though like other than the beats is just how compelling of a presence he comes across as he's just an incredibly dynamic performer he uses his voice in interesting ways he uses all kinds of different flows his singing voice is more incorporated on stuff like all my heroes are cornballs and I just, I, I dig it. He's, he's cool. Like him a whole bunch. Um, I listened to, uh, this is probably like the fucking fifth time I've mentioned this goddamn album, but it's in a different circumstance because I think it was, I think it was Stephen Hyden actually, who tweeted recently about listening to the war on drugs, a deeper understanding while on the road. And I had to do a particularly long drive to go see my girlfriend's parents in the last week or so. So uh, throughout that drive, I turned on a deeper understanding, which again, as has been said, that is a, that is the car road trip, like going across uh, particularly like uh, it's very Americana-y in that respect. And it's got this it's just got this feeling, man. I can't quite describe it, but holy goodness. Driving to Carrollton, Kentucky in the morning, listening to that, and then driving back to where I live in the middle of the night while listening to Aviary. Um, that was an experience. That was a, that was. And uh, on the car ride over there, uh, I was fucking catatonic because I hadn't slept. So my girlfriend actually brought some CDs with her and I listened to two albums that I would have probably never listened to, not never, but I wouldn't have listened to otherwise. Um, uh, one thing uh, about Re uh, that you'll learn very soon because of upcoming content is that she, she's two things for music. She's a Swifty and she fucking loves One Direction. So naturally uh, I list, or we listened to the first self-titled Harry Styles album, which I had heard before. It was just kind of a long time ago. And I mentioned Fine Line a little bit ago as being an album I'm pretty fond of. And, you know, I like this album about as much as I like that one, which is to say a pretty good deal. I like how stripped back the self-titled is. It's very Southern rock influenced. Uh, it's not as poppy. It's not as shiny as something like Fine Line, but I think it works. Uh, Harry's just a really compelling presence. I like his voice a lot. I'm, I'm still kind of waiting for him to fully embrace his sort of identity, but he's, uh, he's definitely a, a step ahead of the, his contemporaries in that regard. Uh, and the other album I listened to, which is an album that was very important to her, also in the vein of something like One Direction, uh, is uh, the album from Niall Horan, uh, Heartbreak Weather which I didn't know anything about Niall Horan other than like he's makes music that nobody fucking talks about. But also when people are like this is talking about the solo careers of One Direction, everybody's just like, well, at least he's not Zayn. And like, <laughs> that is to say, I liked this album quite a bit actually um it I didn't really know what to expect from it like sound wise and it's definitely like a sort of pop rock kind of fusion but it also just sounds like I, I was reminded the production of uh stuff like Radiohead's The Bends uh in terms of what kind of like flavor instrumentally it goes for decent album uh i kind of like niall more as a songwriter than i expected to uh the album itself too has a really solid like sort of narrative through line that's uh pretty enjoyable and yeah i i didn't expect to really dig either album as much as i ended up digging them uh but that's the thing is that i don't don't uh misjudge boy band members i suppose because sometimes they can be real good. Uh, that said, I'm definitely not ever going to listen to any of Zayn Malik's music because sweet, merciful Jesus, have you heard any of those singles? M meanwhile, Liam just is, exists. Making incredibly uncool dad rock. It's just you like... Know, <laughs> you know, there's something to be said for that, actually, for the fact mm -hmm. that he's doing that as opposed to doing, you know, so something cool. Like, it, it, it's probably yeah. shit, but like, I respect... Oh, it's bad. I respect that more than I respect 
cashing in. Oh no, it's and it's funny too, just because Re knew all about sort of like the narrative of the band members. And it's funny that like I remember like Zane leaving One Direction was like this big news event. Like I don't know if you all remember this happening, but oh, it was yes. like he he was doing it because he wanted he was out of step with the band and he wanted to pursue his own career creatively. And it's just like meanwhile, the album he made sounds like every album that was made in its respective year, and he's like the most consistently boring artist of all time. Meanwhile, Niall and Harry just went on to be like, yeah making it pretty decently good music it's like <laughs> oh that's funny a couple things first thing is uh listening to thinking of a place while the sun sets on a very long car ride is oh is experiencing the kingdom of god right there yeah you're correct um, you are spitting the the other thing is um you mentioned that re is a swifty and a huge one direction fan Mm -hmm. And uh, it brought to mind a tweet she had a couple days ago that was something to the effect of, I may be a Swifty, but at least I never had a Green Day phase. And I just, I just want to, <laughs> I need, hmm. you, you have, you have to acknowledge that the music, no. I want to point out that Re at one point, uh, we I couldn't do it just because I didn't think the week we did it, we did a segment like this. Um, but I listened to a lot of um, Fearless Taylor's version with her uh, one week where we didn't record the main episode of the podcast. And she told me, and I quote, to tell to say on the podcast, I listened to Taylor Swift in the car with my girlfriend who is a faggot. Oh yeah, she de then, she demanded that I say this. I, um, I remember I remember you telling me about this, yeah, and I and I remember saying in response that she wasn't a very good faggot. <laughs> <laughs> a couple more things. Uh, one, I also moving listened, swiftly along. <laughs> moving swiftly indeed. I also listened to Deeper Understanding again this week because it's never a bad time to listen to that, and also because. Um, a lead that was somewhat buried is that their new album is out. I mean, for me, anyway, the day we record this, we will obviously be reviewing oh, it next shit. week. Oh, shit, yeah, that's right. We'll obviously Fuck. be reviewing it next week. It is um, Stereo Gum just published a piece on it, calling it their best album yet. I'm really excited for it. I can't wait. I've deliberately avoided the oh, single. Really? Uh, and so as soon as we're done recording, I'm probably going to go and throw it on and cry. So that, that one thing I have to add. Uh, the other thing is, also, if you're, a, if you're out there, if you're a Swifty, uh, and I already know that the Venn diagram of overlap between the small number of people who are interested in this podcast and people who are fans of Taylor Swift is admittedly small, but we are, we do have in the pipeline a special review for the upcoming release of the Taylor's version of Red, which I am quite excited for, to be frank, so... That's going to be something that you can look forward to, and I'm sure it's going to be a really good discussion because Re, of course, is going to be involved heavily in that discussion, um, which I'm very. We're excited. also going to do a ranking of her albums uh, together, uh, if we can, uh, just so it can coincide with it. You can sort of get where we're coming from with her uh, discography and what have you. So, all of the Taylor Swift content that you likely did not ask for. Um, <laughs> but that said, if you are a fan, you don't have to entirely hate us anymore yeah just and morgan in august and of course morgan and august god are, bless um morgan and august are taking the fifth on on those particular video they fucking ideas. suck dick so so don't worry <laughs> this about is that. the worst film ever released <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to know their opinions i'm quite happy to just copy paste literal sections of the folklore review into the new video because i'm sure they would be practically identical uh, the problem oh is God. that this is the most boring album of all time <laughs> anyway anyway <laughs> continuing yes indeed yeah first off i was gonna shout out to my improvised terrible halloween idea for doing a uh, metallica's black album <laughs> <laughs> that's what that is yeah. <laughs> and it's the snake you know, I appreciate the effort. You really did cut that out and tape that on to a black shirt. And what's better, black pants. Wow. We really Damn. spare no expense here. For spare no expense. 
all for the viewers. Anyway, what I've been listening to, I listened to the Mothers of Invention, or now just the Mothers, because they're at this stage in the career, their career, the Grand Wazoo. You this mothers. Is, this is their uh, their <laughs> second uh, jazz kind of album in their big band jazz style, where Frank Zappa was uh, reco- still recovering from an injury he had sustained at a 1971 concert promoting their album Chunga's Revenge or his album Chunga's Revenge and never not funny <laughs> big big Chunga's and uh so this this album is in, this is kind of a big band jazz album it's really fun really creative uh and it leaves me with only one more Frank Zappa album to listen to before I'm up to date with what I listened to with apostrophe which was the first album of his i listened to so we're on track and this album kicks ass and has some really funny moments and also just really compositionally intense awesome moments uh definitely gets a recommendation uh moving to another entirely different thing from nails i listened to fucking unsilent death this is a power violence death grind album and it kicks ass the guitar tones the production is brutal and what really sold me is that the writing is amazing these songs are yes genuinely really well written unlike typical like grindcore death grind stuff where it's very much just throw something vague at a wall there are actually rather disturbing intense songs on here like suffering soul comes to mind which Mm. is just a nightmare and a half to read the lyrics of i listened to this also just because i saw august gave this a particularly high rating and i had only heard nails more recent album you will never be one of us which is fucking awesome and you should all listen to uh and i co-sign everything august has to say because it's fucking great and And it's like 20 minutes long (laughs) and then this album also ends with an awesome like four minute song that's just yeah. atmosphere, atmosphere, atmosphere with like five words total in it. And it, it's so good. Anyway, and importantly about this band Nails is that as opposed to Nine Inch Nails, their so- Nine Inch Nails' songs and albums are nine times longer than this band's. It's true. Uh, and that quite literally is true because the fragile is a, like almost exactly that nine <laughs> times as long as this. So uh, that works quite literally. Um, a thick ass four vinyl thing I have of the fragile over there, just being like, no, I won't fit in a plastic sheen thing because fuck you. I'm currently reading uh, James Acaster, the comedian's book, Perfect Sound, Whatever, which is about the music oh, of yeah. 2016 and how he thinks it's the greatest year for music ever. And he tells a story in the book where uh, his friend, the comedian Ed Gamble, went to see Nails live and they they before every song they said something along the lines of this one goes out to all the fucking people who you know try to bring you down or some bullshit like that but because not Nails songs are like 90 seconds to a minute to 90 seconds they were saying this before every song every 90 seconds and it was apparently the funniest thing in the world that, no that sounds I, hilarious imagining james a caster at a nail show is like imagining like stephen merchant at a fucking cannibal corpse show he, he also <laughs> he also told a great he also told a great and equally incongruous story about the time that he and ed went to see death grips and <laughs> they played a single um like dissonant, incredibly loud, harsh noise synth tone for over an hour and before they started actually playing songs. And that's, yeah. that's, that's a Death Grip show for you. Hell yeah. Continuing on, I listened to Hooster Do's debut, Everything Falls Apart. Uh, Hooster Do, one of my uh, 
quickly rising to be one of my favorite bands as a matter of fact i love love their shit and this is much earlier on in their creative processes so like the real harshness of their tones the real abrasiveness of their sound is not quite yet found but i think there are still some really compelling individual tunes on here the title track is really good in particular and there's a few others that caught my ear but uh not the most essential listen but i still got a kick out of listening to it and finally the thing i'm going to wrap up with and something i'm going to wholeheartedly recommend to everyone on this podcast if you haven't heard it because uh this is my shit this is your shit this is morphine cure for pain this is a 90s alternative rock country jazz band who i'm in oh yeah let's fucking go an incredibly unique kind of sound that is really yes a fusion of all three of those things with a really bass driven bass heavy jazz sound it's really like (laughs) tear in the beer type shit there's a lot of the final track is called (laughs) miles davis's funeral yeah oh dear i'm sorry i'm still stuck on august's description of this as real tear in my beer type shit yeah (laughs) it's it's amazing no but there there is quite literally a song (gasps) that's uh almost exactly about that and then you've got songs about being like a backdoor man and stuff like that it's it's real classic, established songwriting stuff. Vocals are phenomenal. I, I love it to death. This is a great album, and you all have to listen to it because it's only 37 minutes long. Okay, they they apparently, they're on Apple Music, they've released a, a single in 2021 in September, and it's called Dance. And it's a, the cover is a picture of an anime girl and it says hip hop rap. I think that's a different group entirely. It's posted <laughs> under morphine, which is really fucking funny. Yeah, that's that's got to be a different group entirely because the <sighs> lead singer is dead. Uh, fuck. Uh, the only <laughs> thing of note that I've been listening to for the last uh week have been the first two albums by a band called knuckle puck uh the third of which we were going to review last year uh, but did not because it was mid um but these first two albums are fucking excellent sort of emo pop punk hybrid and so much so that i think uh i'm gonna do their first album copacetic as a record club because the it's it's a uneven album but a really interesting one. It even does its own goodbye sky Harbor on the last song. Oh shit. Hell yeah. And it's fucking fantastic. And there, there there'll be a lot to dig into lyrically there, I think. Uh, So that'll, that should turn into something. And their second album shapeshifter uh, is not as good, uh, but there's not really a miss on there. Um, Just 10 really solid pop punk slash emo tracks so it's like uh, a it's like a lawrence arm situation where we just happened to discover them when they released something substantially subpar but they have a really good back catalog yeah yeah i would think that's fair to say okay uh, that's good to know yeah i mean you uh, had me you had me at goodbye sky harbor i mean you only ever have to invoke that song and i'm it's already downloading word yeah that's probably all i'll talk about for the moment okay well i have a few things i want to shout out this week it's been a really good week for listens for me i'll get straight into it uh the first thing i want to shout out is uh and probably the thing i want to want to put the most emphasis on which is hilarious because i gave a fresh 10 this week and it's not this album it tells you how good a week it's been but i want to really emphasize um what i mean i've been spinning the albums that we we're reviewing this week a lot but the album I've been listening to the most in the last seven days 
more than any of that is an album that unfortunately is, is brand new, but we may not get the chance to review it. We'll see what happens, I guess, but it is the new collaborative album from the shoegaze emo king, Paranool, and his fellow uh, artists in that same vein, Asian Glow and Sonhos Tomam Konta. Uh, never not familiar with the other two artists beforehand. I should mention, actually, this is not a collaborative album. It's a split album, which means that there are Paranol songs on it. There are Asian Glow songs on it. There are Sonhos Tomam Konta songs on it, but they didn't work on the songs with each other. They're just separate songs. And for a split album, it works incredibly well as a single cohesive experience. It is um, almost as good as to see the next part of the dream. It features my favorite Paranol song on it, which is high praise considering how much I love that album. The song Colors is brain melting. Um, but the whole thing from front to back is brilliant. I made a comparison on Twitter where I said that parts of this album are like if Deftones collaborated with Deaf Heaven. And I realized the magnitude of that statement, but really like, I'm just describing how this sounds. And that is the particular combination of influences that comes to the fore in a lot of these tracks. There is straight black gaze on this album at certain points as well, which I was not expecting from um, Sonhos Tomam Konta, who, is, who really like shreds his vocal cords on certain tracks here. But yeah, the Paranormal songs, there's four Paranormal songs. They are all absolutely at the level you would expect from Paranormal coming off of To See the Next Part of the Dream. They are every bit as good as the songs on that record. One of them's an interlude, but it's still a pretty good interlude. The other three are behemoths and they're brilliant. Um, but the real, I guess, takeaway is that Paranormal does not outshine his fellow artists on this record. The real victory of this album is that all three artists are equally good on this album. And if you've enjoyed any of Paranormal's music this year, then you should absolutely put this at the top of your list. I can't, it's too soon for me to tell whether it will be on my top 10 albums of the year list, which if that were to happen, would mean that Paranormal would be on there twice. Um, but it's absolutely of the quality where that's entirely possible. And ticker type beat. Yeah, and, um, and I can guarantee at the very least that that song, C Colors, will be on my songs of the year list um, because that, that, that thing, I listened to it, I, I went outside and I lay in the grass and I put my headphones on and I listened to it yesterday and it was, it was sublime. It was everything you could want from that kind of music. It felt transcendental and as, as, as stupid and tacky as that term is, this is just how it felt. And that, to me these artists are the future of both shoegaze and emo to me like where those genres are, are likely to go in the future how they're going to evolve i think these artists are leading the charge and you can expect to see those genres um moving in a direction that shows clear influence from these artists and um, so if you want to be ahead of the curve on that, if you want to get at the get in at the ground floor, obviously listen to to see the next part of the dream. It is a masterpiece, but check this out as well, because it's almost as good. Um, and frankly, there are about half this record is easily on par with um, to see the next part of the dream. Also want to shout out, uh, I listened to a record on the recommendation of our friend of the podcast Connor who can always be relied upon to give really really good recommendations but I took this one particularly seriously because I noticed he gave it a 10 which is a very you know Connor is um, a bit stingy with his 10s um, so whenever he does that I know that and because of how much his tastes overlap with mine and a lot of us I know it's going to be worth checking out and so I checked this record out it is a record from a sort of screamo post-hardcore progressive metal band called gospel and yes that confluence of genres is deliberately designed in a lab to target us the four of us specifically um, it's kind of like if how to describe it it's like if envy collaborated with fucking maudlin of the well it's like that sort of shit it's 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 amazing, but it's also like it has a jazzy elements to it. it. And not in the sense that it has jazz instrumentation, but in the sense that like it's really like progressive and it's structures and 
the songs just are really unpredictable and they don't go where you would expect them to, but they still find really satisfying climaxes. So the album's called The Moon is a Dead World. It's the only album this band have released so far, although apparently, according to Rate Your Music, they have a, a follow-up, which is coming 16 years after that album, supposedly Jesus. to be released this year. So we'll see how that turns out. I mean, high expectations considering how good The Moon is a Dead World is. But yeah, I listened to it once. I thought it over. I gave it a 10. I listened to it again. And I'm confident in that rating. It is ballistic front to back brilliant i i mean i'm trying not to be too effusive with my praise here because i realize it'll it'll when i praise a lot of records it, it kind of just probably blurs together but this thing this record is really really worth checking out connor was absolutely right about about it i i'm glad i made the time to fit it in because it blew my mind one of the best listens of the year for me um Couple, another thing I want to shout out is I revisited a Zach Core album this week, The Drones Feeling Kind of Free. The Drones are an Australian blues rock by way of noise rock band. Um, think uh, if Matt Elliott collaborated with Black Midi, uh, you, would appro- you would approximate something like what The Drones do. Um, so Feeling Kind of Free is a big Zach Core record. I revisited that. Uh, which was a record I loved in 2016 when it came out and I still really, really love. But I also went back and listened to the album before, which is called I See Seaweed, which is even better, uh, much heavier on the blues rock. There's a real Nick Cave in the Bad Seeds heavy influence. Obviously, it's also an Australian band and the singer does sound a little bit like Nick Cave. But I See Seaweed is kind of like murder ballads by way of fucking... um, what's a good comp like I don't know a Tom Waits album like yeah I, I, I'm I, like it's like murder ballads by way of fucking bone machine with a whole bunch of other shit thrown into it it's a really fascinating record it has some very wailing vocal performances that are definitely reminiscent of the wildest moments of both artists but it's also totally unique as well it's a band with a similar appeal to liars as particularly their early material where they're more noise rocky uh and sort of tribal but yeah it's a great combination of all of those things uh highly recommend checking it out if that sort of description interests you uh some less effusive praise so some other records i checked out this week um a couple of new releases i want to shout out that didn't blow me away were kind of just fine but i did like them enough to think that they would be worth shouting out Um, The first is that I listened to the new album from ambient folk artist Grouper, who has released some of the most beloved sort of uh, hypnagogic ambient music of the last 10 years. So a bunch of records that me and Zach and Connor and Pokey Jim love, uh, records like Ruins and uh, Alien Observer and Dragging a Dead Deer Up a Hill. Great albums, really unique sound. Uh, Shade is the name of the new record. It leans much more into the folkier side of her sound. And unfortunately, as a result of that, it does feel like it has less of a clear identity than some of her best records. It it does blur together a little bit. It's very short, which helps to, I guess, not have that be a real serious problem, but it definitely didn't hold up to the standard I was expecting, unfortunately. But if you are looking for some really cool kind of like distorted um blissful ambient music that's really heavy on like thick drone and gorgeous vocals then grouper's earlier albums are a cut above absolutely worth checking out unfortunately shade not quite at that level i also checked out uh an album we were considering reviewing this week until every time i die came along which is the new parquet courts album sympathy for life Uh, i've seen this album catch a lot of flack online i've seen people who are fans of this band really decry this record and i want to say it it really lowered my expectations and it's really not that bad it's actually i quite enjoyed it it showed a lot of it's kind of like a more subdued talking heads sort of vibe um talking heads by way of i don't fucking know like a, a new wave band yeah talking heads by way of like a more new wave band sort of thing um, but I definitely think that if we reviewed it, it would be a bit of a Fontaine's DC situation. So I think it would, was for the best that we didn't. But if 
you have enjoyed parquet courts in the past, then you may well enjoy this record. I, I definitely think it's not close to being one of their best records. It's absolutely one of their least immediate and most kind of like plotting albums. But I did enjoy it more than I expected to. It has some really solid songs on it. So yeah, take that with a grain of salt if you're interested in checking out that and or if you were put off by some of the negativity that has been spread about this record, it's really not that bad. It's worth listening to if you enjoy the band or if you enjoy sort of like new wavy, uh, post-punky, early 80s sort of stuff. And yeah, that has been my week. Let's move in to the first of our two major reviews today, which is, of course... Do I look like I know what a JPEG Mafia is? Well, JPEG Mafia is somebody who's not really like, I remember becoming aware of him when his album Veteran was starting to make waves, but he's been sort of in the scene since Tyler mentioned earlier, uh, Black Ben Carson. Um, And yeah, he's sort of the, at the forefront of a very like, for lack of a better term, a very online kind of music that's very rooted in internet culture and sounds that are born from a particular scene. And um, uh, I will apologize to Mr. Peggy for very earlier, very uh, facilely comparing him to uh, Death Grips because I know he hates that particular comparison just because he's very like, his brand of alternative uh, hip hop is somewhat comparable in that there are elements of uh sort of rock and sort of industrial parts to his music that are reminiscent of something like death grips but in many respects jpeg is a far more accessible artist i think the thing about him that really caught on to people was his very eclectic very unusual approach to production and uh, generally speaking, the sort of flavors of alternative R&B that show up in his music. His veteran is a very, like, it's a pretty abrasive project, but it's also, it's very hard hitting. It's very immediate. Uh, it's very long, very sprawling. Uh, it's full of personality. And when he followed it up uh, with, he did like an EP, he did um, All My Heroes Are Cornballs, which was also very, very warmly received, which I think leaned a little bit more into alternative R&B, sort of diversifying his sound a little bit, um, playing a lot like with more eclectic production styles. And earlier this year, he released EP2. Uh, and then sort of work he was talking about releasing something else and then eventually we got the release of LP here which is his I guess third fourth canonical uh, record and it's very like difficult to describe him just because there are so many different signifiers of his music I would just I would uh, call Peggy both irreverent and almost like deadly sincere in his music simultaneously uh he has uh, a very boisterous very loud very kind of fun personality but also uh there's a an authenticity to his music that makes it feel really like homegrown and um for lack of a better word i guess just very personal uh and lp here is definitely sort of an extension of the directions that he's been going in Um, really doubling down on a lot of the atmospheric production that he's been dabbling in. Uh, All My Heroes Are Cornballs really had a lot more uh, synth play uh, than Veteran did, and uh, this sort of follows in that stead. And honestly, I don't really know how to chart his trajectory as an artist just because he is so all over the place in a good way, in my opinion, when it comes to his sound. I don't know whether to classify uh, something as an evolution, as a progression, as a regression, because at this point, he's just assimilated so many different things. He's uh, a beast of his own making. On this very Mm -hmm. album, he says he's the the Black Frank Zappa. And it's just kind of like, you know, I think there's a lot of truth to that in a sense. The, the way he combines genres, the way he combines sort of his sense of humor, um, which, good God, one of my favorite parts about this album is just how goddamn funny it is. Uh, mm-hmm. Like fucking with cops, call me Lana. 
yeah. one of my favorite lines uh as well as what a I what really, a good line there and there's so many like it all over this album and he, he it's he's no stranger to that kind of stuff but um one of my fav other favorite lines is uh uh, on the opening track trust which i really really love the opening track um but he's just like about to go to work gonna praise god where <laughs> it's just like it's so like his delivery of it is so sincere but you can tell that it's like you know obviously mm. he's, he's taking the piss but uh there's so uh many different moments on here where his personality shines through and it doesn't really ever get old for me just because he's constantly delivering th this this persona in so many different sounds on here uh there there's like one song on here i can't even remember which i think it might be god don't like ugly or hazard duty pay where it's just like there's just this fucking it sounds like the track is being swallowed by a live performance of a guitar just fucking going stupid and it just sounds fucking incredible and it doesn't mm -hmm. sound like anything that's been on a previous album of his but there's also stuff like trust or dirty which does sound like it could come off of something like all my heroes or cornballs and mm -hmm. you know while i can't really designate something as being like a you know it's really difficult to to you know chart him trajectory wise I can definitely say that this is one of like my of his projects that I've listened to this is in the upper tier for me I think it might be my second favorite of his just because all things considered it's a 50 minute long album that never really hits the brakes it never stops being creative it doesn't really stop being enveloping minus one or two moments that I find comparatively less compelling i think this is one of the most consistent hip-hop efforts of the year at least in my opinion anyway yeah i i've been really struck with jpeg mafia over the years and i think there's something to be said about how he's emblematic as a singular figure that represents a lot of the ways in which alternative hip-hop and fringe hip-hop and experimental hip-hop which is a term that i kind of dislike but the things that I mean he gets associated with with death grips because they're when acts from the alternative experimental hip-hop world break through into wider culture they're usually anomalies they usually break through by some measure of chance by some measure of luck I mean you could tie in the influence of Anthony Fantano into that which is something I'm not going to explore but is probably can't deny as a part of that narrative but I think what jpeg does so well as communicates like a lot of these artists like people like backwash as well how mm -hmm. rich and deep and actually full of color and history this world is that it's not sort of just this fringe thing that's just occasionally popping through into the mainstream that actually it's this whole entire world of cutting edge sound of really enticing and and great sort of like ironic postmodern humor filtered through all of that and just a real kind of pop jpeg mafia i think connects with so many people so many people because he has such a finger on the pulse of how the majority of people who are into music the majority of people who are into hip-hop the majority of people are into the sort of alternative sphere of music think about art and think about the power of art and think about the importance of provocative and you know fringe art that actually shifts and widens the boundaries of what a particular hip-hop mc a hip-hop producer a, a, a figurehead can be and i think one of the ways that jpeg does that is he has such a kind of colorful personality and he's not afraid to kind of indulge in aspects of his you know identity and potential queerness and image and all of these kinds of things as well that don't dictate the kind of performer he has to be or the kind of like figure he has to be but allow you to sort of understand like the malleability now in, in 2021 and 2020 of, of like what a hip-hop solo artist what a producer what a rapper what, what a person can be and I mean, obviously, he's not the only artist representing that, but I think he's one of the most important ones. Uh, and you know, in, in a similar way to someone like Tyler, who we've also reviewed this year, who's also taken this particular year 
to release something that I would describe as particularly sprawling. And that I think is a good way of describing JPEG Mafia's approach to constructing an album, to making beats, to putting songs together, is that it's not about crafting something that's like honed to a T and like has this kind of like perfect holistic shape like we might be used to, but it's about really like throwing energy and creativity and craziness into your album and making it feel like a cohesive experience despite that. And I think JPEG Mafia does a reasonably good job of doing this, more or less. I will say I'm not the hugest fan of him personally. Like, I, I think he's really, really good. I think he's really, really talented and really, really important. But I don't have a sort of strong connection with all his albums the way that a lot of people do. I, I'm particularly a pretty big fan of Black Ben Carson. I think Veteran is really, really good as well. Uh, all My Heroes of Cornballs has some great songs. And LP, I think, is probably not up there with those for me. Uh, on the whole, I think that it is a bit more of a sort of uh, fractured experience in a way that doesn't quite like have an intensity consistently across it that my favorite ones of his have but also it's enjoyable in its own more subtle way too like I think something has to be acknowledged as well is that this album has been released in two versions an online version and an offline version and initially that confused me but I've come to realize the reason for that is that uh he was unable to get certain samples on certain tracks cleared. And so his yeah. label said, you can't put these, we can't put these songs on streaming services. And so you can download the offline version, which I think JPEG considers to be the definitive version of the album, which has additional tracks and a slightly uh, changed sequencing. You can download that for free on Bandcamp. Um, but and I've seen a lot of people going like, well, the on offline version is the only one you can listen to. The online version sucks. It's compromised and all that sort of thing. I've listened to them both. I think they're both about as good as each other. Uh, yeah, the, same. the online version suffers a little bit from because of the fact that some of the songs that are on the offline version exclusively, like Has a Duty Pay and Dikembe are like fucking great tracks. Like Has a Duty Pay is my favorite song off the whole um two records or, or the whole sort of collection but you know the um the online version also has its charms because it includes three songs from his 2020 ep at the end of the record cutie pie and the two versions of bald which i think are a much stronger end to the album than the offline versions end which is still good but doesn't have the kind of conclusiveness that those songs sort of have as the finish I think it's already impressive that I that JP gets away with putting two versions of the same song at the very end of his album because it's such a fucking banger and because the remix is heat in such a different way to the original because of Denzel Curry. Um, I'm rambling at this point. I've kind of just kind of gone all over the map. I'll come back to certain tracks on this thing. But yeah, my I I, I think I find JPEG Mafia as a producer as a kind of cultural figurehead, as a personality, a little more interesting than I find his albums on the whole, but it's still been a real pleasure to dive into this and to experience the an insight into the way that he thinks about beats and music because he has such a unique approach to the way that he puts songs together. And there's particular beats I'll get into that I want to talk about because some of these are fucking mind melting. But um, yeah, on the whole, it's I, I'm psyched that we finally got had a chance to talk about this guy. I think is the more like the the I guess the biggest like fan and like longest person who's like followed his career. I guess it's just I I will say uh, I'll posit a bit of a disagreement is that I, I I do think the albums are basically as good as each other in both their different versions, and I don't really have an interest in like trying to parse through which one's the real one because it's just like yeah at the end of the day they both exist listen to them both make up your own mind but I don't really care for the way that the online one ends of the like the bald and the bald remix are great songs don't get me wrong but just like as an album I just think it's a really strange choice to end the it with a re with a song and then a remix of itself and bald in and of itself doesn't really feel Feel like a clothing pack to me i kind of like the the untitled finisher a little bit more it just sort of ends in a little bit more of a low key place. and i think it comes down to what you value in his sound because i, I would describe the way he can 
constructs his collage. There's almost a bedroom pop sensibility to the way the guys are thrown together and that it just sort of sounds like he's this maximal artist who's taking everything that is at his disposal at his disposal to uh, make what he's doing. And the reason I like this one so much is because it, I, I guess I'm not a bigger fan of when he goes for that really hard hitting or industrial sort of sound. And I kind of like the smoother sort of R&B tinged projects like this and uh, All My Heroes Are Cornballs just a little bit more. That's what really makes his sound unique to me. Uh, like what sets him apart from other alternative uh, hip hop acts, I guess. Uh, and I feel like it's explored a little bit better here. I like the sort of atmosphere of the entire record and beats. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's just sort of a overall thing. But I have like Tyler, but I want to know what August and Morgan think, just because I don't think they really have a precedent for uh, Peggy's music at all. Well, I guess generally I did enjoy this. I, I definitely really loved a lot of the... Uh, really heavy synthy directions this took i i quite liked that and i guess for the for the record i did spend most of my time listening to the offline version just because that was the version jpeg himself said he preferred so i was like that's what i'll review i'll, I'll review what he thinks is the air quotes definitive version of this um and anyway i I definitely enjoy a lot of the uh, sheer, like, I love the production for the most part. I think it all sounds really excellent, incredibly strong, very uh, incredibly unique sound to it. I think the really heavy synthy stuff was basically... Uh, that that was basically a freebie in terms of appeal to me in regards to instrumental really shiny sparkly bubbly synths are just all oh, fucking over this the, album the yeah fucking synth on i think it's damn 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 or it's no it's kissy ah. face emoji or fire emoji whichever one it is has these fucking lush synths on it that just fucking mm. melt my brain and yeah and it's a textural that. marvel frankly Oh yeah, no, no question about that. Uh, yeah, the texture, perfect. I guess personally, uh, just to kind of finish up my general thoughts, uh, if I don't, if I get into specifics, I wasn't uh, universally compelled by this really i liked a lot of what it was doing i thought peggy's flow was tight impactful uh i just was not really a fan of how i guess impermanent a lot of the songs felt it felt like a lot of tracks just went by way too quickly and i thought the ideas lyrically were there to develop something longer instrumentally I it could I felt it could have been put into something larger and more cohesive. Sounds to me like you'd probably be a bigger fan of veteran. I think that's a bit more of a uh, direct and I guess a little bit more developed. I actually I think a lot of it too is that at least for me, Peggy's appeal, a lot of it is in the same thing as like I would almost describe a lot of his sound play something meeting point of one oh tricks point never and jay dilla to the point where it's like even some of these more brief tracks i can definitely see why they would come off as insubstantial to somebody but to me i guess i just really enjoy the the raw sort of like uh the raw sound of it, it is just really really enjoyable and uh really really unique in a way that something like donuts would be so i guess it's really sort of a mileage will vary of just like hey is this more enough for you or is this mm. like you know or does this sort of come across as being a little bit more slapdash but and yeah i get yeah. that and i think the donuts comparison is a really good one just because i I find I think Donuts works a lot better as a cohe as like this kind of scattered brained whole than this mm -hmm. does, where I feel we're just moving through things pr 
perhaps a tad quickly for how I would like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it uh, doesn't surprise me too much that you feel that way, August. I would have to co-sign Jake's sentiment that when I think about it, the album that feels like it would appeal the most to you would be Veteran, um, because that's just the one where it's most off the wall in terms of like production creativity and those aspects of the sound that you've said you've enjoyed. But the thing with JP is I think a lot of his albums have and this is i think is something that has intensified with cornball and this album they have this mixtape feel of which isn't inherently a negative thing absolutely not but it's this feel of like jpeg exploring all of these different possibilities for what his sound can be and who he can be as an artist which that aspect is one of the things that makes him so cool right that makes him so exciting jake said that that's a really important sentiment to get across um and it's I think something that's cool to see him develop, but I still feel like he hasn't quite fit, made that masterpiece yet where he does all of those different things and makes a kind of a series of perfect songs every it, single yeah. time with it. I, I think that's definitely a sentiment I share. I mean, I can't speak for his whole career, but that definitely feels in line with how I feel about this. Yeah, I actually completely agree with that, honestly, like even as somebody who really, really, really likes all his work is that he's somebody I'm a fan of mainly because and I'm excited to chart his career in this like while I do like straight up love three of his projects, including this one, what is exciting to me is that he hasn't really made that definitive project yet. And I'm like waiting for it. Is that yeah. like, it's it's like, he's got these albums that I do think are really great and really exceptional and really unique. And it's like nothing else out there right now. But I feel like we're taking steps in order to get to the inevitable uh, apex of his career. And yeah. I'm just not sure when that will be. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see when though, because obviously like, even if he never ends up making that album and just does a career full of weird uh, albums like this, I will follow it because I love all of this stuff so far. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I will say I do really enjoy the whirlwind aspect of the experience of putting on a JPEG Mafia album. Oh, that, totally. That whole, like, just you're just getting pulled in all these different directions. That experience on the whole is one that I always come away from, like, really positive about. And I think, I, I think JPEG is better suited to that kind of whirlwind style than say like Tyler the Creator was on Call Me mm -hmm. If You Get Lost this year, for instance. I mean, I feel about the same about that record, but I think I like, I think JPEG is more suited to this kind of like sprawling long form sort of thing. But um, one thing I will say that's kind of emblematic of what I said earlier about how it feels like, it's awesome to see him exploring all of these different directions and like aspects of complicating his person at his persona as an artist and exploring things as well as kind of having that tongue-in-cheek sense of humor is the song thoughts prayer on this record which is essentially mm. a cover of britney spears baby one more time and it's and it's it's lovely it sounds it's especially great. good on the offline version I will, I will also clarify as well because the online version has more subdued percussion that i don't think that it feels like a compromise but um the yeah, that, that song is kind of a cute idea and it's funny when it happens, but it's also like, I could see you fleshing this mm -hmm. idea into something that feels a little bit more than just a, a, a funny little joke at this particular point in the album. And that I think is a little, and it's not to say I don't think he should do little, little skits like that. Um, and the, the production's great on it as well. I'm going to beat a dead horse there, but it, it's kind of emblematic of what is so exciting about JPEG as this unpredictable artist, but also how he could still flesh out some of his ideas a bit more. But I'll, I'll stop there for now because I want to hear from Morgan as well. Morgan, what do you think of this record? What's your experience with JPEG and how does this album sound to you? Yeah, this is my first experience with Mi Mr. Mafia. Um, I, I enjoyed this album a lot. Uh, Peggy as a lyricist is always really sharp even though sometimes I'm like shut up man uh, but you know <laughs> the man is just spitting so much <laughs> bullshit from his mouth that some of it is going to land for you and some of it isn't he, he's um, very antagonistic and provocative in that sense I, I kind of agree with you and I kind of like that about it is that it's he, he's very evocative in that way the thing that I would say holds this back the most and what is also a great help to it a lot of the time is this sort of mixtape feeling 
which is particularly ironic considering the title of this particular album. It's certainly something that I think he can achieve based on just listening to this, but he's here. I do not think he is quite writing the line between consistency sonically and consistency with quality. Cause I'd say this is fairly consistent quality wise. There's nothing on here. I really dislike, but I think you can make a great album that is not entirely sonically cohesive uh, as long as all of the songs are as good as each other. Those those are some of the best albums. And based on this, I think JPEG Mafia might have that in him. But this ain't it. But that's also not the biggest problem in the world because it also lends this album to being consistently interesting. Although I will say that... It, why, why are there two... I know why there are two versions of this album, but why are there two versions of this album? God damn it. Just just one. Just one. I know it's not anybody's fault, but it hurts uh, my it hurts me. I think maybe a, an, aspect, an aspect of that that kind of like captures maybe the floor is that we've said like there's no noticeable difference in quality between those two versions of the album. And they do differ like in some pretty significant ways which tells oh, yeah. you which tells you that maybe neither is the most realized version of what it could be and they both have their own kind of drawbacks that said uh with that kind of i guess slightly negative element emphasized i want to shout out some of my favorite moments on this album and get some feedback from you guys yes. as well on what you think of these tracks um, I Jake's already beat me to, to it, so I'll echo the sentiment that trust the opener is such a fun start to this album. Mm -hmm. Like I love, again, it's it's a great example of how Peggy can just completely pull the rug from your expectations, but still sound so completely like himself. Like because when I put a Peggy album on, I'm expecting to get insanity in my ears straight away, and this is quite a friendly opening to the album. Mm -hmm. It sounds bouncy it's so pleasant and fun but not like ironic in its pleasantness it's just genuinely like heartwarming and it's like piggy is his own hype man on this track he has this real sort of infectious confidence and energy i'm looking good i feel it i'm nice. looking fresh <laughs> like these every, bitches conniving every time that, he just yeah. does that oh, it's that so is, like it's hilarious it just, it's, it's impossible not to grin when he does that like he just has Go that great assonance praise god <laughs> no yeah, i'm sure I, you are peggy yeah i uh, gosh i love i loved this opening track a lot it it was almost a mood and this is kind of where i'm kind of a perfect example of brushing through ideas in that i really loved the mood on this and then there's just nothing else on the album remotely in this same lane sure yeah, yeah um that, that's, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing i'm going to say that's just that's an observation and take it how you will yeah yeah no i i understand that feeling to be honest but it, it, difficult for me to be upset because it slams straight into one of my favorite tracks on this record which is dirty, dirty. which has one of the most fucking like you're like you listen to trust like oh okay this is this is some fucking this is some smooth shit from Piggy. And then you go right into Dirty and it's like, fuck, okay, this is this is my particular brand of Piggy that I respond the most to, uh, as opposed to Jake's kind of more inclinations towards his kind of softer side. I'm 100% the baby I'm bleeding type beat kind of person yeah. who, when a track like Dirty comes on, it's just like the scraping tones and how like melodic they are, the really like clattering percussion that counterpoints them. And the, the sense of like, yeah, the mood of the instrumental is different to trust, but I like the way that it's kind of, Peggy's continuing to sort of ride the high of that track. Like in a lot of this album, actually a good way of describing it feels like a kind of a victory lap for him. Like oh, a yeah. lot of this is him celebrating himself and he does it in a way where he can make you on his side and it doesn't feel like, you know, self-congratulatory in an off-putting way. It feels like, yeah, fuck yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Like, yes, you're, you're, you're fucking. You're, I am going to go to work. I am going to praise God. I am feeling fresh. Like, yeah, and, and you're happy for him. He and, and he, it takes a really good, 
personality and rapper to do a lot of like braggadocio like my life's fucking great now and have you feel genuinely happy for them and like on their team as opposed to being like yeah okay um so i think piggy does a good job of doing that that said another limitation of the album is that it does feel a little bit like by the time you get to the home stretch and he's still sort of doing this kind of bit on a song like um, The Ghost of Ranking Dread, which is a good song, but he's still kind of doing that bit of like, you know, this braggadocio thing. It does start to feel a little bit, little bit, just a tiny, tiny bit stale before the end of the album. And I would, and if there's one thing I would have liked is in particular from lyrical content, it would have been maybe a little bit more diversity in terms of what Peggy's writing about. That said, even though he's kind of consistently in a sort of singular mode with his writing on this record, it is a really fun one. It is a really uh, exciting one. And he, as a performer, is so energetic and his flows are so good and like just technical that it's easy to forgive um, that aspect of the album for me. I think that honestly, like, I'll disagree slightly and say that I think there's enough varied topics of like, there's definitely sort of the braggadocio effect, but I also think there's a whole lot of introspection that uh, he sort of mined a little bit deeper on All My Heroes and uh, a lot of talk of like him as a, a symbol, as an image. And like, it just sort of like balances throughout these sort of three things and sort of how they relate to each other throughout the entirety of the album and in my opinion it does so in a pretty balanced way um at least enough for me anyway and it also does it in really interesting ways that i think it sort of balances out in the sound as well like on one of my favorite songs on here which is uh, what kind of rapping is this uh which is a very sort of evocative title of just sort of like this is probably a question that people like you know more mainstream listeners might take a listen to his music and ask themselves but it's so like sparse and spacious at the very beginning like it almost sounds fucking cosmic until it gets kind of dirtier and weirder in its final third um just sort of like he's exploring every single facet of his sound in order to like make a point of like what kind of rapping is this and or is this even rapping is this just him being in his own lane and he does so uh it's a really good results here i really love the sort of um the the beat at the end and the sampled vocals and like the i'm looking at this one i'm looking at that one it's so slick and all of the hooks on here are just buttery fucking smooth uh which is another uh sort of takeaway that i thought uh cornballs was sort of an improvement upon is that he's so fucking good with vocal hooks um all over this entire record they'll just appear with reckless abandon uh sometimes there'll just be like five different uh individual hooks in a single song and it'll be fucking great um and i mentioned earlier uh the song uh end credits which I love that fucking oh, sort yeah. of vocal sample. And then it's sort of those guitars just kind of build and build and build at the beginning is just like talking about getting pulled over by a cop and then taking out a gun and putting it against his forehead. And it just gets more intense and more intense. And it's just like, it's like you're listening to him live on stage with somebody <laughs> like a guitarist losing his fucking mind. And it's yeah, just no, fucking and great. Credits is definitely another very high point for me. It, it's, yeah, it's, and that's, yeah. I think that was maybe my song with like that I thought had the best delivery in terms of his flow and yeah. his presentation of what he was saying on it. That was phenomenal, I thought. 100% agree. Yeah. I, I love like the the sample of, because Peggy's a big wrestling fan and I've had to educate myself on this when researching oh, yeah. this album, but it opens with a sample of wrestling, controversial wrestling legend Arn Anderson uh, hyping up. And <laughs> I just love when he's like, the way he says, I pull out the Glock! Yes, it's it so fucking it. great. It's so fucking good. I, the way he says that makes me laugh. I will say uh, I I really like the like the I think the album's very like balanced out like Morgan said there's nothing on here that I even think is really mediocre but uh the one weak spot on the album for me kind of comes very early on to disrupt the pace a little bit and that's Nemo I don't think this song is bad but to me it sort of 
stands in stark opposition to the rest of the album in that it's a comparatively more minimal beat that just really stands out in a way where it's like all of these other beats are so enveloping and like cosmic and shimmering and like discordant but also super beautiful and this one is just kind of like thrown in here and it kind of disrupts the pacing a little bit it's also you know a little bit on the briefer side as well so it's like all of the things that like you might not gel with when it comes to Peggy style just kind of accumulate on this song and I think he's good on it uh his delivery is great lyricism is great but just from a more like a sonic standpoint I almost think the album would be better without it just because of how like substantive and long that it is uh and like Tyler said before the two, two different versions of the album are so uh you know they do have enough differences to the point where I do think that you could just kind of take a song out of the sequencing and it really wouldn't suffer all that much for it I think you know dirty and, and credits would actually be a really cool uh interesting uh choice there but like the rest of the songs here I genuinely think are just basically straight heat there's a song later on in the track list that sort of stops to be like Peggy just sort of like has this sort of like not spoken word but it's just a conversation between him and somebody else talking about an album and then it goes into this really fucking beautiful piano ballad it just comes out of fucking nowhere and it's just like god how does this dude still manage to keep surprising me with the kind of shit that he pulls like this and yeah. I, I love that kind of shit yeah that was on the track tired nervous and broke yeah, um, yeah. that's a great fucking song and that's but- that's kind of the i guess albums one of the album i guess maybe not one of kind of the only big real epic track of this album yeah with like, it's like five fucking- and a half minutes well yeah, it's- mm. I enjoyed this. I enjoyed this track. I was less hot on the the outro, which is actually the person who's with JP Mafia is actually Kimbra. I learned from Genius. Oh, um, which I, okay. I think I think the the rest of the song. I think the actual like meat of this track is fucking fantastic. Easy standout. Uh, his he's so fiery in his delivery mm-hmm. on this track, intense, but he's also genuinely funny in the way that he knows how to be. Like, there's some lyrics here that I want to. Um, Oh, what, oh yeah he, the moment where he talks about i, I got caught for p- possession i feel like sarah mclaughlin uh which is a reference <laughs> to her song possession which just really kind of like caught me off guard like his his batman his like really niche batman references in this track are also really funny too um little bruce wayne i'm so special with it um and <laughs> yeah just a lot of really funny like this to me is like a quintessential um piggy song in a lot of ways and i'm just not as hot on the outro because it feels a little tacked on to the song what i do like though is i think the piano ballad that he and kimber do like at the end of the song i mean piggy has an amazing singing voice it can't be denied. He really that's again why i really like the sort of latter half of his career a bit more is because he's a little bit more keen on singing and yeah. that's like a, a a distinct strength for him that he hadn't really explored beforehand like it's it's yeah. really good that that's something that always stood out to me about the song jesus forgive me i'm a thought from the last record oh god that, i love that that's song. one of his best singles ever because it demonstrates <laughs> that those the dual aspect or the multi-layered aspect of him as a performer the fact he can rap amazingly that he can sing beautifully and that he can cut up samples in a way that no one else can that to mm-hmm. me is one of his most essential songs for that reason Agreed. um and yeah, so I would I love hearing that I, I, lo- I love getting a chance to hear Peggy sing. I just wish that again, this sort of little skit had been fleshed out into a, a fuller idea. But that's a, a nitpick. Um I want to back. It's also speak- just kind of like, yeah, it's tacked on, like the rest of the album. <laughs> like yeah, I true. say that in an endearing way. It's just like yeah. it's no more or less tacked on than any of the other thousand digressions that are on here. Yeah. Um, that said, I'll back step a bit and talk about a, a track I really love because of its heavy Detroit techno influence, which is the song Are You Happy, uh, which has just fantastic samples, great layers of techno influence, opens with a sample of the Detro- Detroit Techno Collective, Galaxy to Galaxy, and then you also have techno elements and the beats and the electronic textures. It's just a really cool like kind of tip of the hat to you know a particular kind of world of... Uh, production influence on Peggy and the track just has you know the sample on this track the vocal sample is so fucking good and just really enjoy the song um and then it goes to Rebound which I think is my favorite track on this record oh Uh, it's so good 
I, I think the most, well, my favorite track on the online version anyway, but um, the Rebound is one of the most fleshed out, I think, and thrilling individual songs on this album. Uh, it feels the most like a classic Peggy song alongside a couple of others. But to me, like this is like, this is, the, if the whole album were songs that had the finesse and completeness of this, it would be a near masterpiece. But anyway, this track is amazing. It has this great sort of cycling percussive role that's multi-layered in the way that Peggy excels at. It has this really cool sort of portentous horn sample that I love. Great fuzzy bass, lots of fun little flourishes that you can pick up on as you listen to it more and more. Uh, a great feature as well from Dat Piff Mafia, <laughs> which who, who turns up and delivers some pretty strong bars too. Um, Another Mr. Mafia. Yeah. Uh, this the Long track, Island Mafias. The Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> this track's also notable for being uh, one of a couple of instances on this record where Peggy flagrantly disses Armand Hammer, uh, specifically Elucid, continuing a very incredibly obscure flame war that's hilariously become part of the discourse around this record. Um, which is just, you know, I, I I actually went on a rant about this last week, but I had to cut it from the episode. But I, I, I my feeling on this and the, the way in which people go like, oh my God, this person does this person. Oh, holy shit. This person's like fucking who won. It's all the sort of like, you know, discourse about like a lot of people nowadays, a lot of sort of younger people nowadays forget like that the point of, like disses aren't serious like they were in the 90s like this so jpeg mafia is a professional shit poster yeah exactly you like fucking idiot like i love when when artists like who when you can see a beef happening and you can tell that this beef has organically come from genuine passion that these people have for what they're doing as well as like a genuine love for fucking with convention as opposed to when like big name artists beef and it's very clearly manufactured not mentioning any names when you get this kind of like underground beef it's like so much more like exciting and fun and i would and i love i hope that elucid and billy woods uh strike back because that line about being named after a baking soda is pretty is and and, and sorry that it was more specifically like rapping about selling coke and and being named after a, a baking soda and not actually being about that world um like not actually having the the street cred to back it up because like the thing with Elucid and Billy Woods especially is that they're quite like academic people and and so yeah you can get into that whole like sort of street cred thing I'm not going to get into it but I think this kind of thing beefing for shits and gigs is is a lot of fun and I and I yeah. approve as someone who's a huge Arm and Hammer fan I don't it's not about taking sides it's just about enjoying the fun of it um, I, I think he's utterly disinterested in things like that. I mean, you take a song like God Don't Like Ugly, for instance, which is yeah. the song where he talks about being like, uh, he says, bitch, I'm Frank Zappa, y'all Sarah Palin, which <laughs> which is fucking amazing. But Sarah, also Sarah uh, Palin, as he pa- says it. Sarah Palin. Uh, which but, uh, there's hell. there's also a part where he says, uh, black men who hate themselves don't like what I'd be sharing. And I think that that's an interesting point of a reference to make about his image is that he's sort of doing that whole, like he's kind of um, sort of pushing the image of his uh, like, not necessarily like sexuality, but his lack of like adherence to traditional hip hop masculinity of being like, you know, th- there's, there's like a big wave of pushback against that. Now. I think that you can see that with a lot of stuff like, like Lil Nas X, like a lot of artists uh, specifically like contemporary, like hip hop artists have come out and said, like, you know, they've been really hating on him. And it's like, it's, I'm pretty sure like fucking Azalea Banks or something said something about that the other day and just mm. absolutely shut down any detractors of it. But I think yeah. JPEG Mafia is very much a microcosm of, of this particular trend. And he's just like, you know, obviously if you're going to internalize all of this shit, don't come after me for pushing an envelope that you're not even interested in looking at. Yeah. 
And it's like the, the thing the, the thing I was saying earlier that I love about what JP does is that it's not about, you don't have to be queer. You don't have to be no. gay. It's just about like- shifting. I don't even necessarily think that he is. And it, Exactly. And it's just shifting the boundaries on like, you know, what is acceptable masculine behavior. Like it's just, it's all about kind of like- advocating for freedom of expression advocating for you know actually being authentically who you are and exploring different images and ideas and and you know ways of being and that is fine that's that being normal having a, a you know exploring that through your art being you know something that should be celebrated and not necessarily like you know the source of all these kind of like you know rumors and all sorts of you know dumb yeah. shit like just just do it for the sake of expression and that's what um, I think Peggy is so great at doing and, and, and often kind of um, puts at the center of a lot of his art. And because it's I think him. it's a huge theme on that album, on this album, too. I think that that's very much just like the, the fact that everything he's doing is basically a creative expression that says something very distinct about him. It's not just something that's like a, an aesthetic or, or whatever. It's, it's all to express something very, very deliberate. Absolutely. And like... The other thing as well, like on with the kind of playful aspect of this record, with the kind of like dissing and stuff, like the whole record is layered with like, you know, oblique, you know, kind of references to how like rapper, rappers be doing dumb shit, like rappers be inferior to me. And it's like, he's <laughs> obviously having fun. With, he's obviously just taking the piss. He's obviously having a fun time with it. He's obviously, it's not to say he, he doesn't genuinely believe that there are a lot of inferior, stupid, dumb rappers out there. And because he's right, but he's also yeah. like, he's not on some kind of fucking crusade to just dis, to destroy no. the fucking rap game or with whatever. Destroy the mumble rappers with facts and logic. Like JPEG Mafia knows that he's JPEG Mafia and that he's yeah. not going to be this fucking in like force to be reckoned with in terms of like popularity or whatever his sort of underground online following it's just like nothing's ever going to come of all of these like insults that he's throwing at other people and i'm pretty sure he knows that yeah 100 percent um I'll, I'll try and speed it up because i don't want to go on for too long a couple more songs i want to mention uh damn 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 i alluded to earlier uh, really love the synth melody here i like the way that it starts as kind of just a synth instrumental because oh, yeah. Peggy lets you take it in and linger in it for a while before the song actually kicks in. And what I like about that is that essentially the first half of this track functions as an interlude, but it doesn't feel like a tossed off interlude because that musical idea develops and gets wrapped over and, you know, becomes something else as the song goes on. So he lets you have a breather from the fucking onslaught and then actually like the song progresses. And so I actually think that, this song is better placed in the online version at the center of the record than towards the end of the record uh, on the offline version. But that's just me. I just enjoy that modulation of, you know, it's not just kind of fucking intense intensity. He, he gives you time to breathe without it feeling like, you know, he's just throwing something in there to waste time, you know. Uh, so I enjoy that. And I similarly enjoy the fire emoji slash kissy face emoji track with its really bouncy, rich, gorgeous synths. They sound so spacious, so huge. I like the way that this is the track with the most like atmospheric synths, but also the most kind of like tinny and fucking like, yes, I said tinny and like- uh, Get the a good sign. Way, in a good way. And like skittery percussion, you have this real kind of like contrast between those things. And he's really furiously rapping. Uh, really great song. Also want to shout out Bald as well on the online version. This was my first time hearing this track, even though it's been out for over a year, I think. Um, yeah, I, I really love this track. I like the way that it has like this cut up drum and bass beat go thing going on in it. I really dig that. And it was actually occurred to me last time I listened to it. Like if you take out the track aspects of the song and you just like have this instrumental that's drum and bass with these kind of like melodic kind of you know eerie melodies it sounds like a dead ringer for a hard normal daddy era square pusher track <laughs> um, i mean tell me i'm wrong it sounds very no, very much no. like that and so yeah i really appreciated that and hazard duty pay i've kind of skipped around because i kind of wanted to finish on that notion but this is uh like my favorite track on either version of the record according to rate your music it is currently the highest rated single of the year oh. as well oh wow um a absolutely a great track it has everything that makes peggy great as a producer in it 
it's a real tragedy he wasn't able to clear that sample but i understand yeah. not wanting to compromise the song itself because that sample that just fucking loud intense sample is so like the cacophony of the song how much shit is happening uh is so integral to like the effect of it and his flow his fucking flow is just you know head spinning um fucking like water uh, yeah love that shit uh, and I guess if I'm to wrap up on one note, uh, one thing I found interesting on the track OG, uh, Peggy noted that he has a desire to be free of his label. This is a song kind of about kind of artistic independence. And I realized that um, this is actually the album that completes Peggy's contract with his record label, uh, EQT hmm. and Republic, I think. Um, and so to me, it's like, I, I kind of started to understand maybe why this record was the way that it was. It was kind of like Peggy, I think is, and he, he gets into this on OG, he talks about like, what does he say? He says, you know, win this album over work for nobody for free. Like, and, and talking about how he is, you know, spitting in their mouth and getting the cash and all this sort of stuff. And like, he is leveling up and preparing for a new era of his career because he wants to be independent. And he has been wanting to get finished with this record label deal and move on to something new. So not to say this as a kind of oblique diss towards this album, but it does feel a little bit like this is Peggy in some ways clearing the slate a little bit, which I think is in keeping with the real kind of like non-title that this album has. It's kind of like a collection of songs, just like the 2020 EP was a collection of songs on an EP. It didn't have this kind of grand title. Um, so in many ways, it feels like Peggy is kind of pulling all the stuff together, not to, you know, say that the songs aren't like the album isn't made with purpose or whatever, but he's kind of crafting this thing to get these musical ideas out, to explore all of these musical ideas. And I expect that on the next project, when he's independent, when he doesn't have to worry about the label, and I think the label issues are neatly emblematic. Of, I mean, what's neatly emblematic of that is the whole issue with releasing this album in two versions you can expect, I think, to see something really special from Peggy next time because it will be a, a new era, essentially, for him. And so I'm really excited for that, personally. Definitely. My three favorite tracks got to be end credits. Uh, what kind of rapping is this? And Tired, Nervous, and Broke. Um, least favorite track, Nemo. Uh, I give the album an 8.5 out of 10. Hell yeah. All three favorite tracks. One, trust. Two, end credits. Three, hazard duty pay. Least favorite track, dirty. Uh, no, Nemo. Yeah, that was the one. Anyway, six out of 10. I enjoyed it. My three favorite tracks, uh, I'll say the Bald Remix. I uh, really like uh, Curry's verse on that. Uh, and the song to begin with was great. So I'll say Rebound and Are You Happy as well as that. Um, least favorite probably the Ghost of Ranking Dread. And I will give this a seven and a half out of ten. Okay, my three favorite tracks are Hazard Duty Pay, Rebound, and Dirty. Uh, least favorite track is probably Nice, I'll say. I don't really care for that track as a sort of interlude or whatever it's supposed to be. Um, and I'm going to give this a seven. So that is an average rating of 7.1 on the whole. But yeah, let us know at home what you think of Peggy's LP. How do you think it compares to his previous records? How do you think it stacks up? What are your favorite tracks? Offline, online version, let us know what you think in the comments below. And now we'll move on to our second review of the day, which is, of course, Every Time I Die are a Buffalo, New York-based metalcore group. Released their first album in the early 2000, I want to say 2001. But yeah, they've been around for a while, a lot longer than I yeah. thought initially. Oh, yeah. 
they have been steadily releasing albums for the last almost two decades, if not two decades. I don't know if I'd call them pioneers, but they're, they're sort of known for taking their hardcore influences and sort of fusing it with Southern rock into something that is just generally called Southern metal, which is the greatest concept of all time. <laughs> um, it doesn't always shine through on radical, which is a bit more of a straightforward metalcore album than anything they've made. Although those roots are definitely there and they do shine through on occasion. Oh, it's also worth mentioning that they sort of reached a, what many people consider to be a high watermark for them with their last record, uh, 2016's Low Teens. Uh, that record did very well critically. That's one of the best records of that absolutely staggeringly good year, in uh-huh. my opinion. I listened to that record this week, Low Teens, to prep for this. And I don't know what I was expecting from a band called Every Time I Die, but what I wasn't expecting was, and this is on me, I guess, was something that was so like full of like charisma and like fun. Yep. Like I was expecting this really sort of dour band and they're actually like a whole fucking boatload of fun to listen to. Like oh, they actually yeah. like, even when they're like really mining some fucking depressing topics as they do on this new record quite frequently, uh-huh. they have this real sort of sense of humor about it and a real sort of tongue in cheek tone that makes them really like uh, endearing just as a, as a prospect. And, not a buffalo, buffalo. and I say them and obviously the whole band are excellent, but I mean, Creed has to go to front man, Keith Buckley, whose presence, whose vocal presence is just fucking consistently. So, you know, like engaging and fun and just like exciting and funny uh so yeah when i approaching radical i absolutely loved low teens by the way i didn't get to mention it in my what we've been listening to but that was uh, an unequivocal hit with me not Killer surprisingly album. um but yeah coming approaching radical i obviously had high expectations based on the buzz that this record had accrued mixed with a little bit of concern at the 51 minute runtime for what is essentially a a band that operates seemed to me to operate best in a kind of more condensed, fast-paced mold. That said, my favorite song of there so far is Map Change off of that last record, which is like five yep. and a half minutes long. So they can ah. do longer tracks. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I was like, okay, this seems to be really, really hyped and exciting. And so what I did is I actually didn't get around to this until yesterday, but I have listened to it three times now. So I have a fairly like confident um, idea of how I feel about it. But I decided like, within a couple of minutes of putting it on for the first time yesterday that I was going to go for a run and listen to this as opposed to just sit at my desk and listen to it. Uh, I don't know why I, I, I really decided to do this thing. Well, I, I've, I've been trying to motivate myself to like get out there and run and like be more fit and active and stuff. And I felt like I was, I was, two songs into this album really enjoying it and I was sitting at a fucking office desk listening to it and I was like this is not the vibe like I need to get out there and so I went Damn for right. a, I went for a fucking run and I listened to this album and I challenged myself to run while listening to this 51 minute record for as long as I could and I completely wore myself out and I don't need to spend too much time dwelling on the story because it's not relevant to the album but um, one aspect that I do want to share with you all is that when the song uh, Thing With Feathers came on oh. at the center oh, of yeah. this record, uh, I, <laughs> I was not expecting. So, so when the song starts, incidentally, like, we'll get into the songs themselves, but like you would, ex- it, you get what it, get, it gets, it does what it says on the tin with a record like this from a band like this. This, these songs are fucking intense they're heavy as hell they have rips they have riffs up the fucking wazoo no mothers of invention reference intended but um Ayo. they have like like all the energy you would expect from a kind of like hardcore metalcore band and then thing with feathers happens and it starts out with this like and just so unexpectedly like an indie song and it has this like you know beautifully sort of clean sound as it starts and I was like immediately you know pumped up off of the energy of the track before it which is all this in war which incidentally is another of my favorite songs on this record because that song has one of the fucking best riffs of the whole fucking year in it um but 
So I'm, 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 my adrenaline level is skyrocketed, has skyrocketed. I am like riding off of the high of this consistent wave of like fucking pummeling sound up to this point in the record. Then the thing with fetus happens and I'm like, whoa, like just the start of this track. I'm like, okay, this is different. I'm in, I'm on board immediately because it sounds gorgeous and the record kind of does need, especially with as long as it does, it needs to have a bit of ebb and flow. Um, so this song starts happening, quieter section with these lovely clean vocals from Keith. Uh, then the song starts to build and then eventually it kicks into gear and then fucking Andy Hull of Manchester oh fucking orchestra, Andy motherfucking Hull turns up on this fucking metalcore song and fucking <laughs> blows the shit up like his vocal his vocals on the track you would not think that andy hull would work well on a song with this kind of loudness and intensity despite the fact that i'm very aware he was on a, a fantastic touche amore track last year my favorite song on that touche amore album but still like that wasn't like the most intense thing ever compared to this anyway um, but he comes on this track and he absolutely matches the energy and the tone of Keith. Like he's obviously not doing anything that's too far outside of his vocal range or anything, but um, he's such a good fit on the song in a way that I wasn't expecting. But when he turns up, I was running down the street. Literally, he starts like piping it. And I it takes me a second to recognize him. And the second that I do, I like trip myself up and hit the pavement face first <laughs> out of sheer fucking, well, I'm pretty clumsy generally, so it's not all that surprising. But Manchester I, Orchestra, boom! I literally, hey, like That explains fucking, why your face looks like this. <laughs> like a fucking cartoon. <laughs> like a fucking Looney Tunes cartoon it must have looked like when I went down, like, like that. <laughs> And it took a minute to, to process <laughs> this shit. And look, it's a great album. I mean, look, I have boring critiques, which is that I do think that it's a little too longer than it should be. And I'm sure I'm probably not the only person that thinks that. And it is like, it doesn't have the upper echelon the whole way through the way that Low Teens does. But honestly, that lack of like, flooringness and that kind of lengthiness doesn't really bug me that much i think part of it was just the kind of ballistic experience of going outside and experiencing this record my adrenaline pumping yes i was a bit fatigued and and well, i mean my mind was fatigued from the album but my body was physically exhausted from trying to run for 50 minutes but look it does get a bit wearying towards the end of it it finishes really 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 strong though especially with those last two tracks i'll get into it more and more in a minute this is just my kind of intro but i had a lot of fucking fun with this record over the last day <laughs> that i've had it i've listened to it while running i've listened to it in the car and i've listened to it sitting around in the house and but in all three of those contexts it is whipped ass but especially when you're out and about and you're able to just fucking just I don't get to go to a lot of shows and that's just because of where I live and it sucks because I would love more than anything to see this band live. I know already that the pit at an every time I die concert is probably like a religious experience. Oh, and I'm God. sad that I probably won't get to experience that, but I'm also kind of happy in my own way because I was able to get on board with this record and get onto the energy of this record and fucking just flip out while listening to this in the same way as you do at a really, really good concert. And so it's an absolute credit to this band, to the incredible production on this record and just to the real ferocious sound of it that listening to this album feels like you're getting the full every time I die experience and not every hardcore, metalcore, not every band is necessarily able to communicate that experience of the adrenaline of the live band on record. It's just something that not every band can do, even the most amazing live bands. But Every Time I Die uh, it, it have made a very satisfying album that is just completely entertaining and ballistic from front to back, features so many amazing riffs that it makes your head spin and has a lot of character and energy and comedy 
that counterpoints and, and balances the kind of relentless darkness of this record and emphasizes the tongue in cheek aspect of that darkness in a really cool way. So yeah, love this. So a, a couple things. Uh, first thing is, uh, okay, I almost forgot it and I was going to hang myself if I did. Oh, God. Um, the first thing is a couple years ago in one of the towns uh, in this state that, you know, basically one of two towns in this state that people will have shows in, uh, I missed the opportunity to see Every Time I Die open for Mastodon and Cohen oh and Cambria. God. Oh my God. And it's be it's because I was impoverished. Um, that's not true, but because I had no money personally, uh, and I would go to my grave unfulfilled. It's like the fucking men with like the with a time machine meme, and it's just like, oh, I'm your granddaughter, Morgan, with a time machine, goes to every time I die concert. <laughs> yeah, like fucking i'm gonna be on my deathbed surrounded by my children and grandchildren supposedly <laughs> and i'll be they'll be like do you do you do you, do you have anything that you want to say to us as your family and i'm gonna be like do you remember in 2019 when every time i die <laughs> over for mastodon and, and oh, okay you, grandpa you know, let's get you to bed I just, yeah I, I remember that. I remember that I couldn't go, and I wish I had died then and not now. I hate you, fuckers. Yeah, well, if, if I could, if I could go see every time I die, open for Coheed and Mastodon, or have kids, I'd go see every time I die. <laughs> losers. Um, that guy. I, I didn't. There was a whole bit with that that I did not plan. The second thing uh, mm. was that your experience with Andy Hull on this album has happened a couple times. So you can imagine my surprise when on separate albums and songs by this band, I have heard uh, verses from Brendan Yuri of Panic at the Disco. Oh, yeah, yep. yeah. He, he's great on, on that song. Yeah. On oh, he really is. Fuck Panic at the Disco. Um, uh, oh. uh, Gerard Way on a oh. song on Gutter Phenomenon. Yes. Uh, uh, Brian Fallon of the Gaslight Anthem on mm -hmm. a song on from Parts Unknown. <laughs> I yeah, they're just happens. like they're just like Morgan Dietley. We know where you live. <laughs> Uh huh. I it was not quite his story or anything, but like I was I was listening to the first time I listened to it was uh, the first night I had to work, and I was just I was standing in the middle of an empty grocery store putting shit on a shelf, and then the second those vocal harmonies come in, I just literally like looked up and to the side as if I was looking at a fucking camera. No one was around me, and I was just like, <laughs> "Are you fucking? Are you fucking hearing this?" <laughs> I think I was you in class. You see this shit, Getty Lee? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I and Getty's think I was like, yeah, class. I was on that album. <laughs> I think I was in class the first time I heard that song, and I, just, I was taking notes, and I just looked up, and it... Is that... It's Andy Hall! Is that fucking... Is that fucking Andy Hall? Are you allowed to do this? Is that permitted? I like Tyler and Morgan... Uh, I fit in between them. I obviously haven't been a fan for as long as Morgan has, but I've been a fan of low teens since I heard that album like two fucking years ago, I guess at this point, which just fucking, I mean, it shreds. What else do you need to know other than that? I definitely think that's like a highlight of the genre for like the decade, frankly. And uh, I do, I, I think this album's like really damn good. I, I share, I, I won't like go as far as to say that I like love it or anything. I have some, some critiques that I can imagine being mildly unpopular, but the, the criticism of it being a little too long, I do co-sign a little bit. Um, it doesn't really 
like like super bother me it's just like if you took out like one of the tracks that I'm not as hot on then it's probably around the perfect length but I'm thinking more along the 40 to 45 minute mark is something that is frankly a little bit more ideal for this kind of record just because it's not an album that's like really focused like super hard on its its sequencing I guess and like the back half really but there's just there's a lot of really great solid fundamental stuff here a lot of great hardcore punk inflected shit I think the opener dark distance fucking shreds I love that sort of the 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 hook at the very beginning is just fucking terrific the spare the only the ones I love slay the rest uh just a great fucking uh, just a great sort of repeated hook and the sort of thematic sentiment over the whole album of just like uh, it's kind of like the um, the world is a beautiful place album that we talked about uh, where it's not like about you know the modern world per se but it's about like you know the music here is largely about you know t- fighting back at your oppressors and just like being downtrodden being like weakened but like fighting back uh taking people to the guillotine as is said on the album which yeah yes uh also a sentiment expressed on a song like planet shit which i think is also similarly just fucking fantastic colossal wreck too uh just there i mean there's just lots of really standout tracks here um I guess if anything, I have I have a complaint with like a specific song and just an overall more holistic one in that like I I don't like it, it's not always a bad thing, but like I, I want the production on this to be just a little less clean. I, I think that the fundamentals and how hard it goes, generally speaking, do sort of balance this complaint out. But something that's a little bit grittier, I think, complements the sort of tone that they would be going for, like just a little bit less polish on this, generally speaking. That to say is the production is still very strong. I want to point out that like, yeah, riffs great, uh, lead singers great. But one thing I need to point out here is the fucking drumming. The fucking drumming on this album is exceptional, like nothing short of just absolutely excellent on every single fucking song these fills are ridiculously complex and i love every single one of them there are guitar tones here that sound just like the dillinger escape plan and every time that happens i'm very very pleased like there are some times where this album just sounds like one of us is the killer and it's like yes so obviously very very big fan of that um but i think that sort of there is a bit of an apex of some of my more minor issues on a song namely the song white void which i don't really like it's just it's the the whole like the 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 cleanliness to it the clean singing the the that sort of like the southern inflection of the sound is definitely really felt strongly here and as a result it feels a bit safe it feels like a very typical rock song that just like it's definitely harder it's definitely a little bit heavier but it also feels like it loses a little bit of the personality that the band has and i just don't like how squeaky clean it all feels just like the vocal lines and everything it, it's just not really my to like the, the sense of the I don't think it's a bad song it's just sort of a culmination of all the little tiny things uh, on this album that like occasionally bother me it's got there's a lot of like minor nitpicks i have but like sitting through this is actually it's it's enjoyable as fuck it's blood pumping it goes hard it's it's you know it makes you want to to punch uh terrible people in the face which is what this music is for so naturally it accomplishes its goal i, I think that generally speaking it's very well written and has a lot of personality in it uh the vocal delivery also is just like yeah he's got good screams and stuff but his range of just different types of delivery is also pretty fucking outstanding it keeps the record from while you know it is kind of long it has a lot of tracks it keeps it from feeling samey even though a lot of the energy level across the board is kind of the same uh but overall I, i really enjoy it it's a really great album it's just that i guess i the Dillinger escape plan has forever tinted how I feel about uh, heavy music of all varieties, I suppose. Uh, but that's not to say that that's like a black mark against this because it, it's going for very different things. But it's a, it's a very, very, very good album. 
Yeah, I'll say one thing, which is that this is peak Nazi punching music, uh, yes. in in every respect, and it's. It, and I will say as well, like I, I, I look, I do think that there is like enough sort of you know enough kind of like application of these songs to various kinds of like situations and stuff but that said it does feel like very much like a very culturally present album like there are mm -hmm. very direct allusions to um you know like particular political figures in a particular polit political landscape that i could see some people finding grating although i think the band do get away with it because of how sort of tongue-in-cheek and fun and kind of just like ballistic they are about it like on Planet Shit, for example, which is a song that has, that I think Keith Buckley said specifically was inspired by like thinking about Mitch McConnell and what he would like to do to Mitch McConnell. And uh, two like, residents of Kentucky in this podcast, I co-sign everything, Keith. Yeah. In fact, I'll help you do it. Just reach out to me, baby. Yeah. And it ends with uh, one of my favorite lyrics on the record, which is that the blade that cuts through their spine has good people on both sides which is obviously very like in your face <laughs> and like, I get it. They're referencing the thing that the dude, the man said, but like, um, it's also just in the context and the way that line really hits. And it's just very kind of like cathartic and satisfying. Um, I love the vocal melodies on so much of this record are so good. Like on Sly, which is one of my favorite songs, has these really twisted melodies that I love. Like criminal, criminal. <laughs> Like that it, shit it sounds like a system terrible. of a down hook, quite yeah. honestly. Yeah. Actually, that's oh, a good, wow. Good I can't point. believe I didn't make the system comp. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Absolutely. I think they're definitely an influence to a certain extent. Um, I mean, and I mean, in terms of like current events and like political social commentary, like Dark Distance in Keith Buckley's words is a song about like wanting a plague to come along and murder everyone except for him and his loved ones and was i think written before covid happened so just like he's like sorry about that and the genius notes which i think is funny but it like it it, it it emphasizes like it puts into this immediate punchy opening track a real visceral feeling of like fucking loathing of the world oh yeah that the last few years i think has induced and just you know, it doesn't try and make something profound out of that. It's just about like fucking screaming about it. Like that's where this no, differs th from this album. Like wantonly misanthropic, and yeah. I love that. And that's where like it works for where, where the kind of like very blunt, you know, political social commentary works for me on this, as opposed to something like the Lamb of God record from last year, because that record feels like it's trying to be profound with its observations, whereas this is just like fucking. It's catharsis. It's pure, just like, fuck this shit, catharsis. And there is emotional depth to it as well. Like like the back-to-back -back combo of a Colossal Wreck and Desperate Pleasures. Like that, that's, Those two songs are like a two-part song thematically, according to Keith, where it's like Colossal Wreck is kind of like this really pessimistic, misanthropic side of things, like a really kind of dark, fuck this wasteland of a planet. Uh, type of song lots of allusions to Percy Shelley's Ozymandias poem sort of like real and immersing you in that and then Desperate Pleasures has a kind of like a more it's like the the other side of the coin the more sort of like optimistic hopeful outlook without losing sight of you know the reality of, of everything and and he, he and it has this like these kind of like little tongue-in-cheek moments of comedy as well like um the part where he's like it's almost unbearable honestly terrible it's like <laughs> yeah that, that's a that, very surge tanky and thing yeah and it's like those little moments help to give the record a little bit of character instead of just being in one emotional mode and i think the record benefits from that I love the intensity at the end of this track when he's just singing, uh, we cannot be saved by the men digging graves. Like that's a great kind of like, oh, fuck yeah. Like fist pumping into the song. Um, I mentioned all this in war before as well. One of my favorite tracks, just the riff in the second half of the song in particular, like this is just like, it made me want to like go on a trampoline and just like do a fucking backflip and shit. Like it just, it's just so fucking like, headbangly fun like yeah i mean it's not the most strongest or imaginative lyricism on the record and certainly if you're going to compare this record to like a system of a down record you're going to see you know the shortfalls of you know 
I mean, not every band can be System of a Down, but um, it has that same effect at, on the listener, I think. Um, and I will say as well, on the note of lyricism, the song AWOL opens up with this lyric that is, uh, the, the shape of your data got me astral projecting. And that right there is a Cedric <laughs> Bixler Zavala lyric. <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, and it just like made me smile because of how like absurd it was and how much it reminded me of him so yeah it's not all like blunt you know folk punk style like really obvious lyrics that are clearly like two-dimensional there is some cool like you know imagery and stuff on this record too um oh, i just dis- tyler folk punk is two-dimensional <laughs> you know what i mean yeah your two <laughs> dimensions are folk and punk <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly what's, um, what's what's the problem here yeah it's no good shit um i will disagree with jake and say that uh white void is a highlight for me i really love that song i love the chorus melody you get what you pay for like that shit is just so fucking good and i'll also shout out uh the song another highlight of mine which is the track or two more highlights i'll shout out and i'd love if you guys have any thoughts on these tracks as well um post boredom from earlier in the record i really love that song, Good song. i love the way he sings my annihilation <laughs> like that another that song where i was like serge tonkin is being channeled here mm-hmm. yeah like That's, this is the yeah. the most explicit the record gets as to being about like the pandemic and it's this and what i works about the song is that it's not just about like oh the shit state of the world that we're in because of the pandemic it's about imagining dying of coronavirus and being reborn and having a chance to like i guess do your life over and and it's a it's a slanted approach to a topical subject that has some creativity to it that i appreciate uh and the other highlight i want to shout out is people versus near the end of the record which i think has a lot of the best lyrics on the record as well as just this real intensity that i love uh i i want to shout out in particular the lyric righteous anger sprung from love is not the same as the fury of a cornered rat which is uh a, a, an amazing description of like you know of, of a political sentiment that the left has i think has tried to express and it's so beautifully expressed within that line that idea of us having this righteous sort of fury this this righteous desire um coming from a place of love for people and love for wanting a better world it's not the same as the you know the fury of a cornered rat the kind of you know it, it's 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 a really powerful sentiment and I mean, this song is kind of like an anthem for, you know, for the left. And I think that Keith Buckley would would absolutely agree with that notion. It's a lot of very kind of strong, powerful and compelling sort of leftist punk anthems. You know, when sadistic kings are bored with gold, know your worth or you will never get it back. Um, the, with enough pressure and momentum, we become perfect circles burning brighter than the sun. Uh, with bad faith you can't pray but you can bend the knee you can kiss the ring like i love the the part of the song where it's like never trust a man never trust a man never trust a man who nah leave it at that (laughs) it's just a really funny moment damn bro you made a point um and then just ending on that note of like that repeated line of there's more to life than anyone allows you like fuck that's such a great fucking point, like sentiment to, to end a song on. And really, I think it's emblematic of the whole spirit and message of the album, I think, which is to kind of, yeah, take charge of your own fucking destiny and don't let the kind of context or situation of where the world is at, like put you off from doing that. Use it as fuel. And I think, yeah, it, it, you know, and above and beyond just being a fucking rip roaring listen from front to back that made me fall flat on my fucking face it's also i think a record that has some genuine power and potency to what it's trying to get across without overreaching you know in terms of what it's trying to do it's just a really satisfying album i have an entirely predictable opinion about this album it's fucking Getty rips. Fucking phenomenal. 
really my only complaint is that it is not the most well-paced endeavor as we have stated in pretty much every other sense i think this is a fucking achievement for this band and for this genre it's provided a, a sort of catharsis that something in music at least in my opinion hasn't provided since like probably run the jewels four and jesus it's just so fucking heavy yeah Shit. it's a it's a fucking it's a it's a fucking mosh pit party that you can beam directly into your fucking ears without leaving the home it is an immersive fucking experience and it has some limitations that we've mentioned but they barely matter when you have something that is as fun as this is and it's you know not all that often necessarily that we get to review a new release where the predominant takeaway is fun and i think that is something to be grateful for and celebrated uh yeah i am simply grateful this week has yielded two new releases that i can describe as colorful fun and upbeat hell yeah absolutely i find that almost funny because this is like easily the darkest every time i die record uh because he's up until this point or up until low teens rather which is not a particularly dark record but it was the darkest up to that point but these motherfuckers were capital i irreverent and that was one of their greatest assets and it remains one of their greatest assets but you know the record also does start with buckley just fucking belting spare only the ones i love so you know yes a little like it can hit yeah yeah you it's a really good point like it's a very fun and entertaining and colorful record and it's all the more impressive for it being all of those things and being also everything morgan just said like a fucking total just riot fuel absolute punk doctrine i, I would describe mm-hmm. it as there's a fucking I, I just looked at their discography and i just realized they have an album called the big dirty <laughs> Uh huh, and I, I I also want to point out how much I love the cover for their album X Lives. Yeah, uh, it's so good. What it is, if you're unfamiliar, is a picture that I assume was not taken for the album cover, um, because it's just that perfect. It's an image of uh, some kid in an Every Time I Die shirt being fucking tackled by riot police yep oh, that's amazing i'll flash that up on the screen when i edit this yeah. like like yeah. it's honestly like perfect because like it's you can just make out the every time i die logo on the shirt too yeah yeah I- i'm definitely going to dig through the back sort of back um catalog of this band because i suspect yeah that these records are going to be a lot of fun to listen to Here, here's a good metric for what i was talking about with how dark they can be but how irreverent they are the first song on that album is called underwater bimbos from outer space the fifth song is called i suck in parentheses blood and then uh the final song is my favorite starve an artist cover your trash yeah um (laughs) but the, the the first song is called underwater bimbos from outer space but the first line in it as i want to be dead with my friends so wow fuck yeah you know hell yeah that that's a hell of a fucking morgan core jake core lyric right there indeed yeah indeed. that's that's jake's whole book series yeah <laughs> oh my god wow you've done it <laughs> wow. those who dead in the dark we will be skeletons those who gay in the butt that is also an alternate <laughs> title for my book series. What's she talking about? Anyway. Um, anyway. All right. Favorite tracks and ratings for Every Time I Die is Radical. Radical. Uh, you, should, you should start. Yeah. Because Jake did last time. I will do the reverse order thingamabob that we do. Uh, my three favorite tracks on this album are. 
planet shit people versus and things with feathers very closely followed by all this in war oh, fuck. um least favorite track is probably 666 and which i only just got the joke of that title as i said it out loud right now <laughs> um because you say six and sex exactly the same yeah six 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 or how how fuck how the fuck should i say it? sax 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 that's how sex fuck, or six that's it's how different. you that's how you sound to me sax 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 um anyway <laughs> <laughs> anyway my, my face my face when carly ray jepson's run away with me <laughs> Okay, um, I'm right. going to give it a 7.5. Very close to an 8. My three favorites are the opener, Dark Distance, uh, Things with Feathers, and uh, what an embarrassment of riches. Um, I'll say People versus uh, Least Favorite. I'll probably say White Void as well, but I also love that song, so it's, I, it's Law of Averages. Something has to be on the bottom. Um, and I will give this a nine. Beautiful. August. Nine times. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> standard deviation about to be a bitch. So my uh, my favorites are... Uh, uh, I like Planet Shit, Post Boredom, and uh, Dark Distance, a fair bit. Least favorite, uh, I don't know, I guess White Void. It's a white void in my mind hey that was, that was terrible <clears throat> six out of ten i enjoyed it it is not even in the bottom 50 worst jokes made on this show no it isn't so feel better most, about that most of those made by sersha so that's very that's, true. yeah <laughs> provably love you sersha we love you we do never stop my three favorite you, songs i mean you, you don't have to stop but you can dial it back my three favorite songs are never Dark stop, Distance, Never Stopping, We Go Together, and A Colossal Wreck. Least favorite is White Void, and the album gets a seven from me. All righty. That is an average of 7.4. So we're, we're hitting the low sevens this week. Really solid, strong albums that you guys should check out if you haven't already, although I'm sure you probably have if you're here. Uh, if you're watching this and you haven't listened to these albums, first of all obviously go and listen to them but also like that's incredibly touching <laughs> that you would want to listen to us talk about records you haven't even heard yet but anyway regardless of what your status is as a listener let us know in the comments no matter what your opinion is let us know in the comments below what you think of either of these albums what they have what they mean to you uh how you think they stack up in their artist discographies are they your first exposure to the artist or is it an artist you've been familiar with for a while? We want to hear from you. We want to hear a comment from all of you, ideally, really, because we do genuinely hear what our viewers have to say. We've gotten to know some of you as, you know, viewers uh, reasonably well, and it's always awesome to hear from you. Make sure you like and subscribe as well. If you haven't already done that, it's really important, really helps us, but yeah. As always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, time X takes a licking and keeps on ticking. <laughs>